اهلا وسهلا ويلكم ايفري ون ذا توك ويل بي ان انجلش تونايت تونايت وي هاف ا لبنيز دتش ديزاينر طارق عتريسي هو از بيست ان بارسلونا Um, he specialized in Arabic calligraphy, uh, so, sorry, Arabic typography, branding, and design for the Arab, Arab world. So I'd like to welcome Tariq. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you so much. First, it's so exciting to be here at uh, the Design Week. Uh, very exciting to see what's happening in the in the design uh, scene here and it's very promising and always exciting to uh, to be part of these events so quickly to introduce myself my name is Tarek uh, Atrisi i'm uh, originally from lebanon and now i'm lebanese dutch uh, and uh, i'm running my design office in barcelona in in spain and uh, we are specializing in uh, branding arabic typography and uh, exhibition design So quickly in this presentation, I will I will I will walk you through a little bit our approach in design and particularly our focus on Arabic typography uh, in our approach in the studio. Arabic typography uh, has been really the most uh, important part uh, of our design approach. Uh, I was very lucky when I was at the American University of Beirut uh, to to be in a program, the program of graphic design, that really focused on on the use of Arabic calligraphy in our design work, on understanding uh, Arabic calligraphy and incorporating incorporating it in graphic design work. And uh, this has often been sort of the key focus of uh, of the graphic design work that we are doing. How can we take advantage of the beauty of the Arabic script uh, to create something that's very unique to us in terms of graphics. Uh, the inspiration has always been the street. At the American University of Beirut, they encouraged us to look around us, look at the street, and look at the typography in the streets, and see how we bring this into our design. And for me, typography is fascinating how it manifests itself uh, in different aspects, on the street, on our daily life, in popular culture. And I've been pretty much fascinated by sort of the different typographic landscape we have in the Arab world. Uh, where do we see type? Where do we see letter forms? How does it manifest itself in day-to-day -day life? Uh, and uh, I've been documenting this and eventually as I left Beirut and went to study further in the Netherlands and uh, at a later stage in New York at the School of Visual Arts, uh, most of my teachers uh, were design legends. Like I show some of the work of Paula Scher who was doing wonderful things with typography. She could use design and use just letters, just type, to create fascinating and amazing design work. And, and most of my teachers were doing this kind of work. There was like a very big typographic uh, approach in design. Uh, you know, I show the work of Louise Philly here and the way she could create like elegant, beautiful design that reflects her Italian heritage through graphic work, purely typographic, it kind of made me challenge as a, as, as a young designer because we couldn't really it was very difficult to design in Arabic much more than Latin it was very difficult to do this in Arabic and have a contemporary graphic design solutions uh, and it was difficult for several reasons because the Arabic script is always associated with us with our uh, beautiful history of Islamic art but sometimes it position it in a completely different era than than the graphic design work and the typographic work that we need to do today uh, so I was very interested in trying to look beyond the Islamic heritage that we have of the use of Arabic calligraphy and look for inspiration of how typography is manifested around us on the day you You know, for me, street typography and popular typography was most uh, inspiring and most relevant to graphic design work because it combines sort of like the combination of textures, of colors, what you need to, to use to incorporate in graphic design work. I think the Iranian graphic design scene, this is work of, of different designers from Iran, is fascinating. You know, they have managed to find a way to use the, the Arabic script and create a graphic design language that is very typical to them, uh, taking full beauty of Arabic typography. And somehow in the Arab world, we lacked a little bit. We were a bit behind. Uh, even though we had like some amazing work done across the years, if we look at the Egyptian posters of the 60s and 70s, uh, You know, there was like a beautiful combination of colors, typography, illustration coming together in a nice way. And this is actually what, as a graphic designer, you want to create work that, that, that stays and, and, uh, and reflects its period of time uh, nicely. 
It's also in the Arab world, we don't have any history of graphic design documentation. So I'm always on the look of how typography was used and design was used in commercial work, not only in, in, in Islamic manuscript, but how, how was it done uh, in communication across the years. So this has always been my sort of ingredients. I'm always using typography and trying to uh, play with this, work with this in different design work, in daily design challenges and projects that we have in our office. Uh, and this, this has been a wonderful journey because, uh, uh, you know, Design now relies, in the Arab world, relies a lot on imagery and my approach was I don't want to use, I want to use as little as possible photos, I want to use most uh, type and letter forms and try to create a graphic design uh, language uh, that reflects, uh, that is really typical to us, that can be said this is Arabic graphic design language and this is not just an international graphic design language uh, adopted to the region. So. Through our work in, as a multidisciplinary studio, type has always been sort of the central point. Uh, typography and lettering and Arabic calligraphy, and I will go through these different disciplines in the samples of work I'm showing. Uh, you know, the beauty about Arabic type is that, and, and lettering is that you can take any form and any shape, right? Take one word in Arabic. The series of posters we did for Dar al Hikmah in Saudi Arabia, uh, they had Paula Sher as a speaker. We took her name and we made a whole series of posters, always using her name and expressing it in, in completely different style. Uh, but type is beautiful as well when you combine it also with photos. When you, when you take advantage of the movement uh, of typography and the dynamic aspect of the Arabic lettering and how it combines with imagery and how it can create richer compositions. Uh, recently I was asked to be part of a, an exhibition on tolerance. Uh, I think around the 20 designers, 20 international designers were asked to design a poster on the theme of tolerance. Tough, uh, tough, tough subject to, to design in a poster. Uh, I was, uh, Paula Sher was one of the designers, Melting Laser. It's an interesting project. You should check it out, the tolerance poster exhibition. Personally, I made a very simple uh, poster. Uh, you know, as an Arab living in the West, uh, you know, you always, you always see how the, uh, every, every um, icon associated with the Arab world or, or religion in particular uh, connotates a lot of negative feeling, negative connotations, unfortunately. We had this photo where uh, specifically the veil was, was shown, you know, not clear if it's from the front side or the back side, with a simple message, uh, replace the fear of the unknown with curiosity. When the exhibition opened in, uh, in Slovenia, it's a touring exhibition, it opens in Slovenia, uh, the poster unfortunately did not survive the first day of the, of the exhibition. Uh, it was immediately torn away, which I found very, uh, very good as a design, because you know, nowadays posters are not that efficient. So if a poster on tolerance managed to provoke an intolerant person to an extent to rip it off. Uh, it was quite fascinating. But then the reaction of, uh, of, of different artists and different people to the negative space created by the poster was even more fascinating uh, and created an interaction, sort of interaction design out of the, out of the poster. To me personally, I saw the sort of the negative space still as, as the, the initial image I had in mind. Uh, it's just a different perspective uh, of looking at, at things. Uh, and this is what I mean that unfortunately, you know, we work with Arabic type and my whole career was focused on, on, on sort of sharing the beauty of Arabic typography. But sadly, because of what's happening, Arabic typography has now become internationally at least and a lot of time a symbol of, of, of a negativity. Uh, another project I was asked to participate in is the Flags of Peace. Uh, this was a project in Holland and they've asked 100 designers from all over the world. They gave everyone the task to uh, design a his own version of the Flag of Peace. Almost an impossible mission. I mean, how do you design a flag for peace? But it was a very interesting project because you could see the design thinking of 100 designers from different parts of the world. Uh, how do they design a flag for peace? Personally, I wanted to use Arabic typography on the flag. My challenge, the challenge that I put it for myself, I wanted to use the word salam, put it on a flag and not make it look like a terrorist flag. Because now when you put Arabic on a flag, it looks like very, uh, unfortunately, like a terrorist movement. Uh, so again, a chance to explore how can you abstract an Arabic word uh, to look completely different, to be seen in a different context, abstracting the letters to the most uh, to the most possible ways while keeping a thin line between legibility and not. Uh, 
somehow Arabic typography, you know, we get a lot of commissions, you know, international brands are interested in Arabic typography. We even had Estee Lauder ask us to design a series of perfume using Arabic typography. It's interesting because, you know, every, almost even with a perfume project using Arabic calligraphy, we incorporate type in a way, how can we show different flavors using different styles of lettering. Typography is amazing because you can design it on the most small thing, like a business card, but you can also incorporate it in large installations. Uh, and it can always provide uh, a different solution or a different perspective to look at it. Uh, when I was asked to design the, the wrapping of the metro in Dubai, I personally always go for the typographic solutions. Uh, graphically, why do I need to use a photo when I can communicate something that, in my opinion, can be more timeless using just type? Uh, and this is sort of the approach that we are doing in every project. Uh, I show a couple of examples before I talk specifically about lettering and Arabic type design. Uh, Fikr, the Arab, uh, the conference Fikr by the Muassasat al Fikr al Arabi, uh, they came to us, you know, they do every year a brand, uh, a conference, and this is the kind of branding they had. Uh, tough subjects, you know, Al Thakafat al Tanmiya, Al Alam Yarsum al Mustakbal. I mean, how on earth can you show such topics using imagery, except if you use a pen photoshopped flying on a highway and, and all these kind of things. And this is unfortunately what we see around us in, in the Arab world every day. This is sort of the challenge we graphic designers are trying to, to, uh, uh, to fight. Uh, the, the topic I had for the, for the conference uh, was uh, al muwatin wal hukumat. Again, how do you want to show this in an illustrative way? You could, of course, but you really need like very good illustration skills, I think, or photographic skills. For us, this is where the typographic solution comes as actually a practical, easy way. We just created a mesh combining the word al-muwatan wal hukumat and, and connected the two words typographically together. And then we were able to create sort of a typographic mesh that was at the essence of the branding. Basically, you have a typographic a style that can be adopted to different print needs that can be apply to different uh, spatial designs uh, using type as forms and letters. Same thing in exhibition designs. When, when we designed the Light of the Middle East exhibition for uh, the v &A Museum in London, we were asked, so they were doing the first exhibition about photography from the Middle East, and they wanted to bring a little bit the spirit of the Middle East into, into the exhibition. Uh, to me, the spirit of the Middle East is on the street. I look for, I think what most represents us in the Arab world is walking on the street and seeing, the, uh, seeing what's around us. So we took inspiration from, from the street. We, we focus on small details of typography from the city of Beirut and sort of applied the same concept that the curator had for the exhibition. The curator has divided the photography in the exhibition into three sections, uh, recording, reframing, and resisting. And we kind of adopted the same approach with typography. We were recording street typography, uh, reframing it and resisting it. And finally created like, you know, use these elements that we got, use letters as forms rather than letters. We looked at letters in a way uh, as forms to be seen and not as shape to be, not as letter to be read. Uh, and built sort of the complete structure of the exhibition, the divisions and the exhibition design concept uh, around it. So you can see in the photos of the exhibition, sort of the, the uh, a light sort of typographic spirit was adopted, uh, but at the same time was not dominating the design because in exhibition design, you always have to uh, give the priority to the art uh, rather than over dominating it. Uh, but this is like sort of uh, uh, the, an example where we kind of try to bring the Arab world in a very subtle way because actually what I'm doing in my in my career the most is fighting the cliches that we have in the Arab world the design cliches that we see around us over and over again uh, the very frustrating cliches you know that everything that's luxurious is gold for example you know if it has to be luxury it has to be gold of course you know give give a designer any color and you can create luxury out of it out of blue out of green out of pink any color can be luxurious uh, the copying in the Arab world, right? Like we want to copy everything that's good. When I was working for Etisalat in, in Dubai, they kept on telling me, do it like Emirates, do it like Emirates. I was so fed up that I just did it exactly like Emirates to tell them, look, you can't do it the same. They loved it. They were about to say, yeah, this is it. This is what we want. So we have this copying culture that, that we have to work hard against. 
you know, the other cliche is like the camel, that, that we make it to represent the whole region, uh, which is culturally very different. All the crimes that we do to Arabic typography, when we take, you know, uh, Latin type, the, the, chop it into pieces and put it together uh, in order to create something visually similar, but that's really destroying the proportions of Arabic type. Uh, sort of the blind, you know, same thing in, in Latin typography, as we do the same. Abu Dhabi, sort of their Latin font, which is supposed to reflect their vision of 2030, is sort of the most orientalist way of looking at, at, at Arabic culture, you know, like it's looking like everything but Arabic, in my opinion. It's like a, how a Westerner sees the Arab world in their imagination, uh, uh, imagining what the type would be. The blind uh, sort of translation, like concepts that are almost always in, in Latin and we just do the Arabic as a last thing, linguistically and conceptually, uh, sort of really nothing could work this way. And how much do we see work, which is completely done in English conceptually and as a text and then moves automatically to be done in Arabic, which simply doesn't work. Green color, you know, who says green color is the color of Islam? We have this preconceived, another cliche that if it's Islamic, it has to be green. Uh, not at all, actually. There's nothing that, uh, that says that. Actually, when I studied the color uh, distribution in all the manuscript at the Islamic Museum in Turkey, the most color that you see is pink when you look at the old Islamic manuscript. But then again, if I have to do a branding solution for an Islamic organization and use pink, I would kind of lose the job, I guess, right? Uh, this lack of, this is Beirut airport, and you can see the departure and the arrival. The, you know, this lack of design uh, finesse, let's say, when you have, when you take your audience as idiots, really, like, and departure is like a rocket flying up and uh, arrival is like crashing completely. So I don't know if I see this, if I want to fly, if I want to take off or if I want to land. Uh, again, another cliche that we all struggle with is sort of the all-inclusive logo, right? the logo that it's a storyboard more than a logo. Uh, this, maybe you can see it here, but there is some letters even behind, just in case you didn't get that, you know, we have the book, we have the Phoenician guy, we have the year, and we have the letters floating around. An identity is not in the logo. An identity, the logo is just like one part of, of the identity. Patterns also, right? We have, it's Arabic design, it has to use patterns, but then when you use patterns on signage, it's the most inefficient function of design because you can't read anymore. You cannot read your wayfinding where you have to go. Uh, so among a society which is new to design, where we are like following the same solutions and, uh, and falling into cliches, uh, we have a confused identity as well. What is Arab identity? Almost in 17 years of design practice, every time a client came to me, he told me, I want something very Arabic. But Arabic, everybody defines Arabic in a completely different way. Everybody sees the Arab world from a completely different perspective. Uh, and of course, I mean, look at the Arab world. We are so, we are, it's a world, right? We have nothing in common. We have different cultures, different religions, different, the way we speak is different. The only common thing in the Arab world is the way we read, not even the way we speak, we read and write, and change. Right? Because the Arab world is changing constantly everywhere, wherever we are. Uh, so in that like sort of mix of cultures, looking again at the one common element, which is the, the reading, the, the script that we read and we write, it's so interesting to see how it manifests itself in different places of the Arab world with all this variety. It's very nice to see how in the last 10 years the Arab brand became cool again. You know, after being uh, for a long time the, the old-fashioned look, we tried to escape it. Now, somehow, all the designers are excited about their Arabic identity and expressing their Arabic identity. Uh, and it's nice, especially because it fights what's hap the wrong practice of importing international design solution to the Arab world. I showed this example. The top part is uh, Amsterdam Airport, which has the best signage system in the world, uh, designed by Paul Meixenaar. Unfortunately, in Abu Dhabi, they adopted the same system. I mean, they bought the same system, they took it, which is, okay. of course, it's a good system to buy, but somehow when we import international solution, we lose something. Like, I look at the signage in Morocco and uh, of course, it's less. It's, it, this is so messy, and it's less uh, 
less good as a, as a wayfinding, but there is a spirit in it that, that, uh, that reflects sort of the local flavor. And that would be interesting to try to preserve the spirit and create a signage system and a wayfinding system which is uh, very well designed. Uh, and I, bilingual design is always difficult, right? I mean, this example from Beirut says it all. If you read in Arabic, you go in one direction. If you read in French, you go into the totally opposite direction. So whenever you're working with bilingual design, you have kind of unexpected challenges that, that you deal with. Uh, and again, I was talking about change in the Arab world. You know, this is the second common thing. Look at Dubai changing so rapidly and how it is today. Uh, this also adds to the, uh, to the difficulty in the design profession to uh, uh, define a certain specific style. Look at any part of, of, of design. Look at architecture. What, what defines Arabic architecture now? It's, you know, everything is, is, it depends how you look at it and, and what angle. And look what, what you have in terms of different approaches. And the same thing applies to graphic design, of course, because even if you go to the most basic uh, uh, visual communication and you take different examples to compare, you can see how uh, design solution can be very dif different from one region to the other. Uh, even the taste, when we talk about Arabic calligraphy, the taste of what is, uh, you know, in Algeria, I was recently there, and this is the most style, the Kufi style is the most visible style across uh, uh, Algeria. Uh, so even the style that you like or what you find uh, appealing in terms of typography is different according to where you were and what you have been exposed to at when, and what you have seen most. Um, this is uh, our queen in Holland, our previous queen in Holland. She was very famous for her hats, like many queens. This was her personal branding thing. So she always have her hat on and every hat is designed to the occasion. When she came to the Middle East, they had to design a specific hat for her, especially you know, up to the occasion of visit, uh, visiting Abu Dhabi. And sort of this was a solution designed for her, which to me is the epic example of fail when you mix East and West, right? Because you don't take like just a hat and like wrap the scarf around it and, and you get to it. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, you know, the Arab world I find is so full of, you know, I talked about negativity associated with the Arab world, but there is so much beauty in the Arab world and the details and the craft we have. Uh, I'm looking at it only from a graphic and typographic uh, part, but there is so much that's, that's very common to us and very unique to every region. Uh, you know, these are different uh, uh, examples just of, of barber shop signs. The right one is in Barcelona, actually. Uh, the left one is in Morocco. So much beauty in, in, in simple, handmade, day-to-day -day, uh, signs typographically. And on a bigger picture, you know, looking at branding and looking at typography, I try to categorize also what are the trends in the Arab world in terms of branding. Uh, how, in what categories brand are being created, what design solutions is adopted to it, and how can we, you know, me as a practicing designer, working with logos and working with developing brands, what are the possible structures to follow when creating bilingual identities? Do we go for brands, for identities that have like an adaptation between Arabic and Latin? Or do we work with contrast between the Arabic and Latin? Do we focus on identities that are totally Arabic and purely Arabic? Or do we make brands that are now focusing mostly on being a Latin brand? This is what I'm sort of uh, trying to uh, structure to understand what are the possibilities in terms of dealing with bilingual design, uh, and this these are the this is the approach also we take when when doing uh, branding solutions. Just like we use typography always as the, as the main components, whenever we are designing a, a branding system, we always go also particularly with logo design with a typographic solution again to fight. Uh, uh, the common practice in the Arab world where you want to illustrate everything, where you want to show everything with an illustration, we find, uh, you know, an identity is never set by its logo. A logo is the most simple thing in an identity. The rest of the identity uses images, photography, illustrations. Uh, and that's, you know, having the potential of, of, of doing everything you can do uh, with the Arabic script, uh, it's fascinating how you, uh, how you could always take just the letters and create any identity and feel you want. You can create the feel of Beirut in the 1950s by selecting a specific type of typography and adapting it further to the application. So in most of our branding work, we are taking advantage of the fluidity of, of typography in order, in order to 
communicate a specific style or a specific feeling. And particularly complicated would be when you're adapting Latin and English. I mean, it, it's Latin and Arabic. We, we criticize it a lot, but it's actually very complicated, you know, like because the Greek West sometimes is to create an Arabic brand out of a Latin brand. Where do you, where is the limit between trying to imitate the shape and respecting the proportions? Uh, I talk about Arabic lettering. I want to conclude by talking about Arabic lettering and Arabic type design. If I look at this, this for me summarizes the difference in, in how you look at Arabic typography. Uh, this is Arabic calligraphy. Calligraphy is the art of, of uh, uh, the art of the letter, you know, like you study for years to be a calligrapher and this is where you have most freedom, uh, but also where you follow the most, uh, uh, the most rules and proportions. Calligraphy is on this side. This is an example of type design, of font design, of designing a font which has to be digital, which has to be modular to work on a computer and distribute to many people. And somehow in between the two, is the practice of Arabic lettering, which in my opinion is in the hands of the graphic designer. It's not calligraphy in the sense that you don't need to follow a specific style and follow specific rules and proportion, but it's at the same time not creating a font and digitizing it. It's the art of designing the word, graphically looking at the word and see what the potential of it is. And in our, you know, in our work in the studio and the most of uh, the branding work we do is always uh, taking advantage of Arabic lettering, right? Because we're always trying to see the word and designing the word uh, and seeing the potential in it. But also in the work that I do with my students uh, in the different workshops we do, like the workshop we are doing at uh, Amman Design Week, uh, Amman Desi Design Institute, Design Institute Amman. Uh, I, I get the chance to work a lot with, uh, with different students and participants and designers to try to push them to explore the possibilities of, of Arabic lettering and how you can, by designing a word, uh, communicate different ideas and feelings. And I show sample of, uh, of these uh, to specifically show the difference between calligraphy and lettering and that lettering falls in a more graphic context and Arabic calligraphy. Uh, it's taking advantage sort of of the, uh, of the tradition and history we have in Islamic calligraphy, but interpreting it in a more graphic and contemporary form. This is Omar's work, who is somewhere, yeah. Uh, I showed just different example of, of uh, participants uh, in the workshops and, you know, a word, a word is a a word is actually a skeleton of form, and the way you decide to dress the word uh, is the way you give it uh, sort of its uh, its style. Uh, you know, in lettering, this is also Omar's work. Uh, in lettering, you can do stuff you cannot do in calligraphy. You can mix styles uh, in one word. Uh, you can make combination of letters and how they connect to each other uh, in different ways. Uh, and I show some of these samples uh, from different. Uh, designers all over the Arab world uh, and also in Iran this is some of the samples that were done in, by designers in Iran uh, which I find um, fascinating actually and I conclude by talking a little bit about Arabic type design uh, type design which is as you know we talked about calligraphy we talked about lettering and type design is designing uh, typefaces digital typefaces that actually are you know computer softwares at the end of the day that you make in a modular way so other designers can use it. I, you know, I started my career with this computer, and uh, which is still the best in my opinion, the, the nicest designed one. Uh, I had 11, as an Arab designer, I have 11 fonts on it. A designer, a graphic designer with 11 Arabic fonts to use. Imagine, this is year 2000, 2001 actually. Uh, so you could see what a big lack we had. So much happened uh, in type design since, but bottom line is we have very little Arabic fonts available uh, and this is how I got into type design as a graphic designer most of the time I needed to design I needed to use fonts that were not existing and this is how I had to design typefaces to use in my work uh, one of the first typefaces I did was when I designed Al Ghad newspaper here uh, in, in, in Jordan and literally the brief was to, to find sort of to have a typeface which is 
which is very bold, which is very confident, which is very contrasting to the typical uh, brands of newspaper which was available at the time, uh, which were much more calligraphic and traditional. So had I had to do this in Latin, I would have just chosen a, a, an existing typeface that reflects this. But in Arabic, there was nothing, nothing like that. So we had to create uh, a typographic logo for al -Ghad. We have to design our letters for the logo and eventually develop this into a typeface. And somehow, this is how, this is how I got into designing types for, for practical needs, for my day-to-day -day practice in our design work. Uh, you know, we, suddenly we were responding to a lot of requests from different organizations like BBC Pharisee, for example. They want a typeface, brands want a typeface that they can own, just like they want to have their logo, just like they want to have their own color palette. Uh, they want typefaces that they own only for themselves so they can have a unique typographic voice. And every brand's typeface somehow needs to echo what they need to project, what is the, the voice they want to have. And you can see the difference between a font for Twix, for example, which uh, you know had to be much more, uh, much more reflecting of the brand than a font for Dar al Hikma College in, Univer in Saudi Arabia, which had to be much more classic. And hence, we made it based on the classic Thulus calligraphic style or a typeface for a TV station like Al Jazeera, uh, which has to take into consideration completely different components and that's being uh, legible on screen, uh, on a TV. Uh, so th these kind of different typefaces we were created always had one thing in common. A lot of custom typefaces were meant to be part of the corporate identity of specific clients. So like STC Telecom, the goal of having a typeface that you own, uh, both in Arabic and in Latin, is that when you communicate without even, without even using your logo, your typeface is suggesting what which brand is speaking and what tone of voice is there. And different projects, dif required different things. Uh, the Metro Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, they wanted really, uh, the difficult thing about type design, particularly in the Arab world, is most of the time you're designing to clients who don't understand design in general. So designing for clients a type solution is even more complicated. Uh, for uh, Metro and Riyadh, we also needed the bilingual typeface, uh, which pretty much uh, has a very strong personality uh, to kind of live up to the uh, to the buzz they created when when they have announced the project of the metro. Uh, maybe one of the most interesting fun typefaces I worked on was the design of uh, the Mathaf uh, typeface for the Museum of Modern Art in Qatar. Basically the client came to me with this brief. They said we want a font that looks like this in Arabic and in Latin. I had no clue what they wanted, but I was in, because this is the kind of challenges you know you like to do as a designer. Uh, initially, the idea, eventually the idea was that they wanted to create a type which is like the hand scribble, which is really like the signature of the artist, uh, the museum being a modern art uh, museum. So we've spent a lot of time really exploring how can we make a typeface that really look like handwriting. How, you know, Arabic is, is complicated because it sits on a horizontal baseline and it never looks really uh, handwritten. Uh, so tons and tons of sketches after and tons and tons of trials after, we kind of like really based, we tried to use mixed technology, the, the, the po techni technical possibilities of designing typefaces with trying to uh, write and find the appropriate handwriting. And we create the Madhaf typeface, which is Latin and Arabic, uh, and which at the end had a very simple function to look like a font that's handwritten, but it's actually a digital typeface that you install and you can write as much as possible with it. And it became at the core of the branding of, of Madhaf and the Museum of Modern Art in Qatar, uh, because everything followed. Even, the, even the, the, the illustration style followed the same con uh, approach. The whole branding was very much focused on the, uh, on the typography, illustration, as I said, and signage. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it was a good example to show how just a typeface can become uh, the, the main element uh, in, a, in a branding solution. Often they don't even use their logo and they just use the typeface uh, to reinforce uh, their identity. Uh, I've had the chance, I was privileged to work with Apple on their typeface, their marketing typeface. Uh, wonderful experience just because of working with Apple makes you understand why Apple is Apple. 
and uh, it was interesting because uh, we spent three years on a on an Arabic type design project. I mean, this is not even a Latin type project. This is something they want to use just for a specific market. Uh, uh, but this is an example how, how, of how ideally I wish the clients in the Arab world were. Uh, we spent the whole year just to research what they need. Uh, and then two years developing the typeface. Very frustrating for me when I used to open a, you know, Apple, uh, I, when I used to open an iPhone, uh, you know, you see everything in, in Apple style, except for the font used to be like 1980s looking typeface that we've been seeing forever. So the chance of, of just uh, working on the marketing, uh, on the typeface that Apple is using on their marketing uh, material, particularly on their website, uh, was very interesting. But again, I say interesting, forget about design, forget about the process, how the client designed the relationship. This was, this was fascinating in terms of how much you get trust and creative freedom as a designer. It was very difficult for Apple to choose us and to work with us, but once they chose us and worked with us, uh, the amount of trust there is in your professional opinion, uh, this is amazing and this is what you know, is very difficult uh, still to have here in our region. And this is a challenge of every designer, uh, I guess. Uh, the Apple font was, uh, I mean, if I talk about it, it's, uh, it was meant to be as simple as possible. Uh, it was uh, uh, supposed to work with Myriad, uh, the Latin, a special cut of Myriad that Apple has in Latin. And it was supposed to do what Apple does, uh, simplify things to the most simple basic forms uh, while keeping functionality uh, as the main element. Uh, so there is there is all these these fonts we do for clients clients that they don't that want to have their own uh, voice and specific uh, identity. I will conclude with two projects we are working on, uh, other type design projects. Uh, there is the fonts we do for clients, which are custom fonts, but there is also fonts that we do on our own, that we as a design studio, we, we, we look at it as retail fonts, and we try to see what kind of typefaces are missing in the market, and try to design new typefaces that fit this niche of missing fonts. Uh, you know, in Latin you see a lot of mm, rounded font, this kind of font, something that's serious yet friendly. Uh, in Arabic, how many how many like really fonts with this feature we have? Like for us in the in the studio, it's very difficult to find, uh, and that's how we start every project. We started a project last year where we wanted to do sort of a, a rounded Arabic font. The, the brief is very simple, like a simple legible typeface which has like rounded characteristics on the end of the strokes uh, to give. Uh, a friendly yet serious feeling. Uh, and we've been working on this. We wanted it to be both in Latin and in Arabic to support bilingual communication. Uh, this is the end product of it, a family of seven weights. Uh, Arabic and Latin, again, you can see in Arabic the, the sort of the weight uh, going from the lightest uh, weight to the boldest weight uh, with samples of usage of the typeface sort of the thinner, uh, the, the thinner weights uh, look the most serious one, and the more you go to the bolder weights, it looks a little bit more friendly and more casual. Uh, and again, these are the, the, the font is called the BCN, Arabic Rounded. Uh, and again, we do these typefaces because we find the niche in the market. We find that we are missing some typefaces in Arabic, uh, and we would like to do it so we can use it in our day to day day-to-day -day design work as a design studio, not as type designers. I will conclude with the last project, uh, which is also a type design project, but it's, uh, it relates a lot to the history of Arabic graphic design and, uh, and our research in this. Mahiyadin al Labad is one of the, in my opinion, one of the best designers that we have known in the Arab world. He's an Egyptian, uh, he's an Egyptian designer that passed a few years away. Uh, passed away a few years ago, and he was more known as a as an illustrator or caricature artist. Uh, but actually, I mean, this is the kind of work that he's known for. But actually, studying his work and looking at his work, uh, he's really a, a, a true and fascinating designer. The work he has done in the 80s and 90s and 90s is fascinating. Uh, Nazar magazine is one of the uh, projects he worked on. It's a, it's a publications that he publication on design and visual communication that he used to publish in the late 80s and beginning 90s. Fascinating for, for, for many reasons. Fascinating for its design, fascinating for its content, fascinating in, its, uh, uh, in the way it, it discussed different elements of uh, visual communications. 
in its identity, Nazar had the dynamic identity where the logo of Nazar always changed. Uh, you know, the, the image and the typography switched always, almost what Google is doing now, uh, but uh, doing this back then. Uh, you know, some of the, the Nazar used to be out uh, consisting of small articles, and each article kind of covered one aspect of uh, a specific topic in visual communication. Uh, one one article was about the bat letter, right? And and all the shapes and possible forms of the bat letter, you know, and fatakat ba'iyya, he would call the, the, the article. Uh, there was a lot about calligraphy and the use of calligraphy. There's a lot about criticizing design and design solutions and the use of Latin and Arabic. Uh, but also there was a lot about typography and calligraphy. And one of the great projects I saw that uh, Mahideen al Abad has worked on was a custom design project, uh, custom design typeface that he, did, he has done for one of the projects he are directed, uh, which is Kitab fi Jarida. Kitab fi Jarida was a, a cultural project by UNESCO. It was based on a basically uh, Kitab fi Jarida was an insert that comes in, in newspapers across the Arab world, uh, uh, bringing, you know. It was a reaction to people reading a little bit less in the region and the idea of giving a book with a daily newspaper. Uh, so it was an insert in, that, in, uh, in uh, newspapers, which uh, was a very rich cultural uh, publication because every issue uh, would take one writer and one artist from the Arab world. The artist would illustrate, would illustrate the entire uh, issue uh, and the content would be by the writer. And the design and art direction of the publication was done by Mahyadeen al Labad. Uh, it was very rich in, in lettering explorations within the publication uh, and in illustration work, given the fact that the illustrator would always change in every issue. But to me, the interesting part in this was the typography. It was, was the custom typeface uh, that Mahyadeen al Abad had worked on uh, in the project. And we, we were fascinated by this font because it had a lot of charm and beauty. And it was that was the project, basically. He, 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 when they did this project, they worked as a group with a calligrapher and Mahyadeen al Abad as an art director. And they've created this font, which was a hybrid between Kufi al Masahif and the Nasakh style. Uh, and too bad that it kind of died with this project, so we wanted to revive it. We wanted to create a revival of this typeface uh, for many reasons, as a tribute for Mahyadeen al Abad, but also uh, as a way to, to look more at the history of Arabic graphic design and try to uh, incorporate it more in our design work. As a first step, we started redrawing the font. We started like redoing it calligraphically, completely, just to understand what the design decisions were behind it. And then we started to develop it more as a typeface, uh, you know, for our needs today in different weights, in multiple weights, uh, extending the character set of it uh, to make it uh, um, as a typeface that will, you know, respond to our needs today as a designers, uh, taking advantage of the beautiful shapes of it, the beautiful character it has, uh, uh, and developing it into a font of our needs today. And I show samples of the font. We are now busy with the Latin part of it. Uh, how can we, there was never a Latin uh, design added to it. So this is uh, definitely our next challenge. Uh, and using it, of course, in day-to-day -to -day design work uh, to see, uh, you know, this is the best part about designing typefaces. There is designing the type and there is using the type. And they are two very different uh, things. Uh, most of our typefaces are on our Type Foundry website, arabictypography.com, uh, where we show in it our custom typefaces and our retail typefaces that we are doing in the office. So, uh, yeah, this was my story with design and, and typography so far. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. And once again, thanks so much for having me here. Thank you, Tari Atrizi. That was such an enriching and uh, informative presentation. Um, any questions? I'm sure there are some questions. <laughs> Hi, is this, uh, is this on? Yeah. Um, what do you suggest for someone who's looking to go into Arabic type design? Um, like, do you recommend any like institutes or? Because I was in a workshop, um, and there were a couple of students like complaining about the lack of um, uh, quality, the quality of education like here in Amman. Um, and so I was wondering if there's any place uh, in the Middle East that you would recommend to study like type design. Um, I mean, 
Yeah, the best. It's it's difficult because there's not a lot of uh, really advanced type design uh, education in the Middle East. There is a lot of workshops and good and good workshops. Some of them are short workshop intensive projects. Again, like the workshop we're doing at the Design Institute Amman uh, uh, in Lebanon. I think now there is a more extended workshop of six weeks. Uh, but unfortunately, unfortunately, the really solid type design education it's still uh, at this moment abroad i mean some of the best schools are either in holland or in the uk in reading in holland in the hague in uk in reading and in new york at the type at cooper uh, 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 program is really good again these are programs that are uh, more focused on latin typography but every arab designer who has been there has learned the basics and uh, uh, and applied it again you know, this is maybe old-fashioned, uh, the, the old-fashioned path. Now, there is a first generation of type designers. There is some really good type designers in the Arab world, some of them who are practicing and based in the Arab world. So another approach would be kind of like to work with someone uh, who's good in Arabic type design and kind of learn from this person as much as possible uh, and try to see where to take it from there. If, you know, traveling abroad and studying abroad is not an option. Uh, I say self-education is easier today now than what it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago. You know, 15 years ago, I had to physically travel all over the world to learn. Now information is very available for you. Uh, so good design schools, extended programs are abroad. If you want to stay locally, you have to do a lot of small workshops or find a mentor to work with. Questions can be in Arabic also. I'm used to speak in English. لأني عايش برا بس بقدر أحكي عربي أكيد سو إذا حدا عنده أسئلة بالعربي كمينا فينا نعمل سويتش على العربي دايركتلي Any other questions? Are you sure? <laughs> okay Thank you so much Tarek Thank you, uh, Thank you so much having again. you with us again Thank you